All right, here we go. Good morning, Harper faculty and friends, and welcome to our final webinar in our five-part series about transitioning to online instruction. This is Stephanie Whalen, Chair of the Academy for Teaching Excellence, and I am here with the Academy team. Chris Dobson will be facilitating today. Melissa Basinger is live captioning, with Janet Woods moderating the chat. Jenny Henriksen, Karen Harold, Phil Mortensen, and Mike Bates from the Academy are standing by to answer questions. Amanda Nielsen has been captioning and posting the recordings of the webinars. And Katie Michalow has set up a creative way for faculty to earn CEUs for their reflection on the live or recorded webinars. And we will show you how that works in just a minute. So oh, I know that most of you have been in here and we just have people adding um, as we go along here, but we do want to let you know that live captioning is happening. So you should get an invitation um, at the top of your screen if you want to have the captions. You should accept that and then you will have captions at the bottom of your screen. We also usually like to tell people that if they want to, they can change their settings so that every time something is posted in the chat, they don't have to have an alert. So Chris, if you want to go to the next slide there, um, it just has the instructions of how you go to my settings and then locate the notification settings and then you can deselect the ones that you don't want, okay? So there will be a lot of activity in the chat. So if you don't want to hear a little ding, every time you may want to do that, okay? So moving on to the next slide, we just want to make sure that everybody's aware of the same information. We are, of course, in fully online mode right now for the remainder of this semester and for summer 2020 as well for the safety and health of all Harper students, faculty, and staff. No decisions have been made for fall. We also have the no harm grading in place. So that's something that we want to make sure you all know. We're really glad you joined us for part five of our webinar series, Supporting Every Student in Your Online Course Through Universal Design. Chris will talk to us today about what universal design is and show us um, a lot of ways that we can make our course content more accessible. If you want to move on to the next slide, Chris, we can talk about how you can get CEUs. So all of the webinars are posted online, recordings with full captions. So even if you miss some, if you want to go back and listen to those webinars or I guess watch and listen to those webinars, you can then fill out a form, ask you some questions and then submit that for CEUs. So you can find all of those on our Transitioning to Online instructor, Instruction Webinar Series page. When you click on the part five one, you'll see this open up and then you can click on the form for um, completing that action plan. And those need to be submitted by May 1st for any of the five webinars. You wanna go to the next slide, Chris? So if you missed any of the webinars, again, the other four are already up there. You can earn 0.2 CEUs per session. So for full-time faculty, obviously those are credits that go toward promotion. For adjunct faculty, the purpose to fill that out would be, then you have that on your transcript as a record of the professional development that you've participated in. So those will be available. Um, the one from today will be available by the end of the day tomorrow and then you can fill out those forms anytime, but you should submit them by May 1st if you want CEUs and you want those on your transcript. All right, next slide, Chris. So as we mentioned, we have to prepare for going fully online, not only for the rest of the semester, but for the summer. If you haven't read the details about the no harm grading policy yet, please look for an email from the provost's office from Maria Kuhns. Going fully online means we do need to ramp up our efforts to make courses and learning experiences more accessible, which you're doing today by being in this webinar. And we have to make sure we're engaging all our students and providing even more support than usual for those who are struggling. So a lot of students are in a crisis situation. So we can't think of it as learning as normal. We have to really understand that students are struggling at a lot of things right now. And if we do offer synchronous sessions, you know, real time where students have to log in. We can do that as long as they are optional, so students aren't penalized, penalized if they can't log in at that time. We need to record them 
for later access. Going fully online doesn't mean that you have to expertly design your course materials and use all the latest technologies. We're not asking you to do that. We're just asking you to do what works best for you and your students and what's within your level of comfort, and we're here to help. If you want to go to the next slide, Chris. All right, so when we were preparing this webinar, we reached out to Access and Disability Services to find out what are the main barriers that students are concerned about when they take online courses, particularly students working with Access and Disability Services because obviously they're among our most vulnerable students. So one of the things that students is, are concerned about is the lack of accessibility affecting their bandwidth because they have to exert extra effort to advocate for their accessibility needs and often have to remind the faculty to communicate with ADS, which is difficult and stressful for them. Number two, students worry whether faculty will respond to email communications from them or from ADS to work with ADS and how to best figure out how to implement accessibility remediation work. Sometimes that's hard because faculty are very busy or miss emails and students worry about the timeliness of all of that. Number three, the readability of the content that's presented to students can be problematic. You have to consider are the documents formatted appropriately or the screen reader software can effectively read the documents. So that's something that Chris will definitely be talking about today in more detail. Also, the coherent sequence of course content organization supports students who may not use English as a native language. So deaf students, for example, who use ASL, Latinx students, students with disabilities, for example, um, as well as students who are blind or visually impaired. So we want to think about really organizing our course in a way that really makes sense to navigate through for all of these students. Number five, closed captioning of the video content is imperative. Auto captions, like for example in, in YouTube videos, often have many errors that interfere with comprehension. At minimum, we want to provide a transcript of audio when we have a video that does not have captions. Ideally, we would caption them. And then number six, Many students do not have well-developed executive functioning skills and will often struggle with things like time management and managing deadlines and managing large projects. So consistent use of Blackboard calendars and reminders can really go a long way to help support these students. So those are just some considerations of the barriers. Now we're going to move to the next slide and we're going to talk about some examples of how you can support learning using concepts of universal design. So here's some things to think about to increase accessibility in your course. First of all, including resources to help students review or even learn for the first time foundational material that students are expected to know or understand when beginning a course. So rather than assuming what students know, you want to provide that foundational material for review or for learning for students who may not have all of that content that you expect. Next, you want to provide explicit instructions that include detailed step-by-step -step narration of how to complete a task, such as finding an assignment link in Blackboard and selecting a file to submit it, rather than just saying something like, submit your assignment here and assuming that the student knows or can remember how to do that. We also want to make sure we're sharing synonyms or additional wording to help students read things like blackboard jargon or terminology from the discipline or common expressions. Rather than not using an idiom, for example, Go ahead and use the idiom, but also include the meaning of the idiom to make sure all students understand the reference. That can go a long way to help make sure students are understanding all of the course content. You also want to differentiate instruction by including things like help sheets with additional guidance for those who may need it, as well as extended problems or challenges for those who are ready for that. So a help sheet could be just a, a list of additional instructions or coaching that you can include with an assignment as if you're meeting with the student 
before or after class and giving them additional instructions or help by including that it's available to the student in the online course right when they need it. And then also, of course, you want to encourage them to meet with you if they need additional help. But having those help sheets can really go a long way as well. And then lastly, we want you to consider that accessibility is essential to equity pedagogy. So it is a social justice issue, which we know is important to us at Harper College. So we want to make sure that we're giving accessibility the attention that it deserves. All right, so now we're going to move into Chris's overview of what he's going to cover in this session. All right, uh, good morning. Um, is my audio okay um, at the moment? This is, can you hear me? Hey, Chris, there's a little humming in the background. There. Um, it's still happening. Uh, maybe if I adjust my mic. A little better. Is that is that any better? Yeah, that's a little better. Okay, yeah, good. Everyone's saying it's much better. Thank you. All right, very good. So our objectives for this session is, is to explore principles of universal design for learning and consider how they can be applied to online courses. Um, discuss how a universal design approach to online courses supports all learners. Uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate and so that hopefully you can learn how to evaluate uh, your own course materials for accessibility, uh, as well as possibly any publisher content, um, things like that. So I will be demonstrating some um, quick check ways that you can check uh, some of your course materials. Um, and then also another, the, our last objective would be to identify uh, resources um, to further address your understanding of universal design for learning, um, digital and online uh, accessibility, and to enhance the online course experience for your students. So uh, with that said, um, I'm going to give a, just a brief introduction to Universal Design for Learning. Universal Design for Learning is a framework uh, to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. Um, CAST, uh, which I believe is uh, the Center for um, Center for uh, Specialized Technology. Um, they've done a lot of the research on universal design for learning. And what they found was that um, our brains uh, are made up of three different brain networks related to learning. Uh, one of them, um, the, the effective networks, they consider that the why of learning. And that uh, particular network uh, revolves around the multiple means of engagement. Um, so how learners are engaged or and stay motivated. Um, the second network uh, would be the recognition network, the, uh, the what of learning. Um, and that is basically providing multiple means of recognition. So uh, that would, uh, that means uh, that we're providing uh, different ways for our students to uh, understand and recognize uh, the content that we're delivering. Uh, so that might mean uh, providing um, different means for them to uh, digest content. So not just reading in the book, maybe also providing maybe a video or uh, some other uh, visual for them to um, understand the content. Uh, then the third network, strategic networks, uh, the how of learning. Multiple means of action and expression. So the uh, the strategic networks um, allow, has to do with planning and performing tasks. Um, are we giving our students uh, other ways to express their knowledge about our content? So, um, is there are there way, ways to provide them with different ways of doing that? Um, differentiating the ways uh, they um, are providing um, that uh, knowledge sharing um, that could be 
look many different ways. It could be peer reviews um, where students are working together, um, explaining what they know um, and testing each other's knowledge. Um, it may also be um, allowing them to record themselves either audio or uh, video um, in a presentation or something like that other than just writing papers. So um, on each of these slides, uh, the slides will be available um, after the webinar. Um, on all of the slides, I've added some uh, uh, I've added links and related resources to anything I'm covering today. Um, so uh, what, the idea is with behind Universal Design for Learning is that we're trying to provide an experience for all learners uh, because their ability varies. They all come from different experiences. Um, some may have already identified with access and disability services. Um, some may not. Um, a lot of times, uh, some students, um, after coming out of uh, their K through 12 experience, um, they may not necessarily want to identify initially coming into um, community college. So, um, and there's always the possibility of what's considered invisible disabilities in the sense that um, they could be on the um, autism spectrum or have a learning disability. So one of the things we'll, you will want to do uh, for your courses, um, especially your online courses, is, uh, first of all, include a welcoming access statement, um, letting them know that um, you're, you're welcoming uh, the feedback from them, um, that they're also, um, that you also have some information in there about accessibility so that you can uh, adjust if absolutely need be. Um, I know faculty sometimes are anxious when they first get a, a student with a disability, thinking that they're going to have to change um, a lot of what they do and how they teach. Um, but um, hopefully with some of this information, um, you can address some of those issues ahead of time before you have uh, a student with a disability. Um, it's actually a lot easier to, especially now when we're all getting uh, some, not all of us, but a lot of us are uh, adjusting for fully online. If you're redesigning your course, it's the best time to start addressing some of these accessibility issues. Um, other things you can do is establish shared ex expectations, um, you know, making sure uh, that students understand what you're expecting of them, whether it be on a, a weekly basis, a daily or weekly basis. Um, establish uh, opportunities for them to interact with their peers. Establish routines within the course to allow for student planning and organization. Um, this is important in, uh, to have uh, a consistent um, a consistent navigation and a co consistent course experience, right? Um, so like if you're going to be teaching uh, different concepts from week to week, um, it's organized in a clear and understandable um, method um, so that they're not trying to figure out what they're supposed to do uh, differently each week. Um, it's very easy to follow the, the continuity of the uh, information and the continuity of the class. Um, so there's things you can do to also with this um, possibly using the calendar in Blackboard, which uh, is also when you plug something into the Blackboard calendar, it will show up uh, on the student's home page or the student's My Blackboard page. Right when they log into Blackboard, they have prompts uh, to complete an assignment or to do uh, different things like that. Um, like uh, they may have a test coming up. And for giving them those prompts ahead of time definitely helps them uh, stay on task. Um, uh, the image here uh, is also just an example of being flexible 
right, uh, with your assignments, uh, providing multiple attempts for them to complete an assignment, um, different things like that, um, and giving them some options of having it the most recent, the last grade attempt, highest grade, lowest grade. This is just an, one example of universal design for learning. I'm sure several of you um, are already making use of several concepts of universal design for learning already. Um, again, there will be uh, links for more information. Um, there's a whole bunch of guidelines and research behind this. Um, there's a whole website for related to universal design for learning um, for higher ed, and that's called UDL on campus. Um, and some of that, some of these informations are, are related to executive functioning. So universal design for learning uh, it is, a, is one way to ensure inclusiveness and um, addressing learner variability by considering some of the following types of students. Again, um, your adult and non-traditional students, English language learners, and again, those with invisible disabilities or learning disabilities. Um, these are all of things that may or may not come up right away um, at the beginning of the class you may or may not know that your student has one of these conditions uh, until they um, are you know until they let you know right uh, they may not have uh, um, identified with access and disabilities so um, some ways to address that may be providing um, a uh, like a, a survey early on in the, the course, uh, addressing like uh, questions to see whether they're having trouble understanding the content or following the content and try to uh, kind of pull some of that information from them um, so that you're establishing a good communication with them so that they feel comfortable um, addressing that with you. So how are some other ways that we can implement concepts of UDL in our online courses? First of all, uh, one of the most important parts of UDL is providing flexible, attainable goals for your students, um, giving them the opportunity to reach those goals, even if they struggle a little bit, uh, building some scaffolding into your content uh, so that they have the proper background knowledge and information to reach those goals. Um, also, um, making sure materials and assessments are addressing, say, the objectives of the course. Um, you know, maybe look at your uh, course outline again. Um, look at those objectives. Try to make sure uh, that those materials and assessments are addressing those objectives as opposed to having them do busy work or something that may not even uh, relate back to uh, the objectives of set goal. Um, other things you can do, weekly written communication with your students, providing uh, daily or weekly announcements, um, things like that, so that they feel that sense of connectedness. Uh, Providing note takers, like uh, you know, possibly uh, either working with access and disability services to get a note taker for your course, or um, you know maybe uh, provide the opportunity for students uh, to do the note taking for other students in the class and posting them after the fact. Uh, I know sometimes uh, faculty do have some anxiety about posting um, recordings and notes, um, thinking that maybe students won't attend class, they'll just wait till afterwards. Uh, but I can, I can tell you from years of experience working with uh, access and disability services, more times than not, uh, it's not just the student, uh, the student with the disability that's benefiting from these type of things. Um, like notes and things like that um, are very helpful for all your students. Uh, be posting flexible presentations. Um, that means that you're um, maybe, not, again, not always presenting content in the same way. Um, 
you know, not just relying on doing a PowerPoint presentation, maybe the next week uh, it might be um, pulling up a, a website and uh, taking them on a, 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 an actual like tour of a, of a resource or uh, going and finding primary resources in the uh, Library of Congress or something like that. Um, also uh, providing uh, making sure the accessibility of digital materials that you're providing them, um, making sure uh, PDF files aren't just a scanned file, making sure uh, some of these files are easily navigable by other students uh, with disabilities. And then, of course, uh, adding giving choices for them in demonstration of their knowledge, right? Uh, giving them chances to uh, maybe complete an assignment uh, in different ways. Uh, maybe for the same assignment, you can choose to record a video, do an audio uh, recording, um, possibly do a, um, you know, uh, like a poster or a virtual poster. So giving them different options uh, that multiple means of representation. And then again, uh, another uh, important one is those interactive online is discussions um, so that they have the opportunity to uh, even uh, discuss with their colleagues about uh, the concepts each week or things like that. Uh, so again, we'll have some resources here that you could uh, follow and learn more. Um, but at this time, um, I think I'd like to maybe just take a minute for some Q&A, if possible. Hey, Chris, this is Janet. Um, so yes. far, we've been able to answer the questions um, okay. in the chat. So, so it looks so like far, so you good. can keep going. Yeah. Keep on going. Okay. All right, we'll do. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not going too fast. I hope. I have not heard from anybody saying to slow down. So perfect. Okay. Seems like you're perfect. Yep. Okay. We're getting Thank you. comments uh, now. Said the pace is fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do next, uh, or I am going to cover some of this information related to uh, accessibility. Um, moving away from universal design for learning. Uh, it's all, all of this is connected to universal design for learning. So um, one of the important things related to uh, universal design for learning and is making sure that uh, your students can address or can work with these documents, can work with um, uh, actually pull them down or, or can um, make sure that uh, assistive technology can work with them. So in this example, um, and you don't have to worry about seeing the text or the size, I am going to demonstrate these slightly after I go through a few slides, um, but in this particular case over here in Microsoft Word, um, it's the example is that it's a structured document. Um, the idea is that you're using proper headings, headings and styles, um, so that um, assistive technology can uh, toggle or jump through a document using those headings and styles, just like you would uh, scan, visually scan a, a, a newspaper for headings of what you might want to read in the newspaper. Um, uh, accessibility allows you to, the by using headings and styles, you're allowing them to have very visual and uh, navigable uh, uh, ways of navigating a very long document. So in this case, um, one of the ways you can do that is by going to the view menu and turning on the navigation pane. And that will give you an idea if you're using headings and if your document's structured right. If you're properly nesting your uh, headings, you will be able to see uh, an outline view next to your document in the navigation pane. So that will give you some kind of idea of the structure of your document. Uh, other things that you can do uh, to ensure accessibility is using 
uh, instead just type in in one uh, before uh, paragraph two before paragraph actually using the lists features up in, uh, in the home ribbon of your uh, if you're using Microsoft Word um, also not just dropping in a URL you're typing in some words highlighting across that and adding uh, the hyperlink text to uh, a meaningful link or a meaningful text. Um, a lot of the problems with assistive technology is they don't know what where they're going to if they're just clicking on a URL. It's it will prompt them with screen readers um, as to if you have a, a meaningful text, they know kind of where they're going before they go there. Um, also, making sure your tables um, are used for uh, not for layout, but for data, uh, and that they're properly, uh, they have head headings for columns and rows. Um, this also helps them able to navigate uh, content much easier. Um, and then making sure your um, images have alternative text or descriptions. Um, if it's decorative in nature, you can you can leave it blank or put the word null and U L L in there uh, for alt text. Um, or if it's decorative, uh, just leave it blank. Um, also, making sure that uh, your color has enough contrast so that uh, the primary and making sure that the the primary method of conveying information or meaning or emphasis is not only um, color, just making sure that things are dark enough um, so that students can uh, switch if they need to uh, to a high contrast mode or something like that. Also uh, with math, um, math is can be particularly um, challenging sometimes for students with disabilities. Uh, I know um, so ways of working around that there are some add-ons to Microsoft Word um, that you can add um, but there's also um, like if you're dealing with uh, content um, externally to what you've created you know making sure it's using something like MathML math type or, or latex. Um, I know Sunil, I believe, uses latex. Um, and he's, I know I've worked a few times with Sunil uh, learning some of this myself. So, but again, I've provided some resources to learn more about some of this information. Um, presentation accessibility, making sure your PowerPoints are accessible. Um, some of this same information will carry over to some of these the other concepts, but one of the quickest way you can check uh, a PowerPoint, say like a publisher PowerPoint, is to check to see if they're using slide designs, layouts, or uh, a template. Um, what happens, one of the quickest ways you can check that is um, you cannot do it necessarily in Office 365, but if you, on the desktop version of PowerPoint, you can switch over to outline mode um, and your, your slide thumbnails will turn into text. If, that, if you're seeing content on your slide that is not showing up in the outline mode, oh, excuse me, sorry, let me back up. Um, so if you're, if you're seeing, uh, if you're not seeing text showing up in the outline mode, that means that it's probably been added as a um, a text box or something like that. Um, I know um, some of the uh, publisher content, um, that most publishers will say they're 508 compatible, uh, but when you actually start testing their materials for accessibility, uh, more times than not, it is uh, they don't have alt text for images and other things. And I will demonstrate a couple of those things. Um, also, making sure that each slide has a unique title. Um, that's important uh, so that if a student is uh, using assistive technology, um, and it's a long PowerPoint, um, they can more easily return to where they were uh, when they left off before. Um, making sure the correct reading order is in, um, it, in uh, PowerPoint, both desktop and the, um, and the uh, online 
uh, you can go into the arrange menu and pull up the selection pane and you can see the order uh, that it would be read um, so it a lot of time the first thing that gets usually gets added to a slide is a title uh, and then maybe some content and an image in this case. So um, what you may need to do is just rearrange that reading order so it reads in the order that you want them to. But it always it basically reads from uh, the the last thing added to the slide to the first thing. So in that um, reorder, you would want to make sure that your title is at the very bottom and that it would read back through the slide and you can test that by just toggling uh, from up to down and you can usually move content around in that selection pane as well to repair the reading order if need be um, again making sure you have meaningful links tables columns and header rows um, for data tables images for alt text again I will demonstrate that this is picture is from Office 365. If you go to the Format tab, if you have an image selected, um, you just select on Format, and then you can check Alt Text and add Alt Text there. Um, and then again, making sure color uh, has enough contrast so that uh, if they were to switch to um, a a high uh, contrast mode, um, things you know. Backgrounds that are white will turn black. Uh, dark content on the screen will turn light. So making sure that uh, you can even test that by in um, by going to your Microsoft uh, operating system um, has a setting where you can go back and and switch to cut high cast mode just to test some of your content. Again, uh, some of this information is. Uh, offered in some of these resources that will be provided. Uh, PDF accessibility, uh, making sure uh, that your content, is, again, is not just a scanned image. If uh, you scan something at uh, the college on one of our um, copiers, there is a setting for PDF for uh, OCR, which is optical character recognition. So if it is a scan only um, image or just an image, uh, maybe you got 10 pages of, uh, of an image, not going to be very accessible for your students that are using any kind of uh, Zoom uh, text, like where they can zoom in on the screen. Um, you know, if the text is not um, one way to check that is to see if the text is selectable um, or if you can search through an image, um, making sure uh, that uh, the PDF has the appropriate document properties, such as uh, title, author, keywords, making sure the language is identified as English. Um, these are things that can be um, added. Um, I know not everyone has Adobe Acrobat uh, professional. Um, you can always reach out to the Academy if you're needing help with some, some of your PDFs, things like that. But uh, um, usually it's, you, you know, the if you have the original Word document or something like that, that's usually best to go back and fix that. Um, PDFs are, are very troublesome for different kinds of disabilities. Um, but um, a, another quick test you can do is open up, uh, you could do this even in Acrobat, the free Acrobat Reader, is to go to the view menu um, and the read out loud and have the um, reader read it out loud back to you. And is that content, um, is it understandable? Is, is it, if it, if taken, um, a photocopy of a, a text and it's still an image obviously it wouldn't be read out loud um, if it if you did run an optical character recognition it should be able to be read out loud and then you can see does it still make sense of working in the proper con um, proper context um, and then again um, do the tables have column rows and headings and not used for layout of a page um, so some of that is not 
easily fixed, right? Um, if you if this is content that you've pulled from somewhere else and not created yourself, um, it can take a little bit to fix PDF accessibility. Uh, one thing that you, um, I can tell you is that um, you can, um, in some cases, open PDFs with Microsoft Word, whether you knew it or not. Um, you can go to the file menu and open a PDF with Microsoft Word. It'll take a little bit. You have there's a little prompt. You got to say um, allow it to to um, allow it to display the content, or um, it basically will do its best to run an optical character recognition on that, and it may or may not work. Um, another uh, possible way is um, in Microsoft OneNote. You can um, you can do web snipping in the desktop version. Um, it's kind of like a print to file. You can take that image, put it into a OneNote, and you can actually uh, copy text from the picture. So it'll run an optical character uh, recognition on that image um, and try to pull the content uh, from that or the text that's in that image. So um, also, if you were to use something like Office Lens, which is a uh, an install uh, on your phone, um, you can use that to take picture of, uh, say, a poster at a uh, at a conference, you want to had a couple posters. You can actually take a picture of that and extract some of that content. In um, one, one, oh, Office Lens will forward that image. Um, in some cases, over to um, a OneNote, and then you can extract the text from there. So this article, uh, Microsoft article, does show uh, explain a little bit of that, um, and then also just. Uh, you know, working through some of the issues, there's an article there from WebAIM, which is um, a group uh, that helps. Uh, they have a whole bunch of articles. They even have uh, training there um, that helps you walk right through, like, how do I write good alt text, uh, which is not always easy to do. It has to be succinct uh, and making sure that the alt text is, is succinct and um, that way. So at this point, I, I, I think I'm going to switch over to um, hopefully everyone can see my screen has changed to Microsoft Word Online. Um, and I was just going to demonstrate for, um, a few things in Microsoft Word Online. Um, so if you're a um, an employee, uh, faculty, adjunct, you all have access to Office 365. Um, you can put your content up to your um, OneDrive and do some of the same kind of testing. But in this case, uh, what I just wanted to demonstrate maybe quickly was uh, the navigation pane. Um, I'm going to go over to the View menu, turn on navigation. And right now, you cannot really see anything here. But when I go back to my home menu, um, if I highlight across text um, and just use the quick styles up here at the top, you'll see over here at the side, um, it will start to um, uh, build out that outline. Um, let's if we go across uh, each of these. I'm just going to start to build out some of these, um, the structure of this demo. In this case, here's. Uh, we did a monkey, a dog, um, and then I'm, you, properly nesting means that uh, you're um, making sure. So since spaniel is uh, beneath dog, um, and here's another one, a field spaniel, um, building out that properly nested outline is, is important. Another thing you can do is go over to the review menu. And uh, there is an option for check accessibility. Uh, when I run an accessibility check, um, it'll tell me, OK, uh, you, have, you are missing alternative text on an image. Um, so you can click on that, and it'll take you to the image that's missing alt text. Um, I, I have, and then let me, actually, let me fix this first. Um, back at home, I'm just going to continue building out that structure um, and then again um, 
if I, I can recheck after I fix things and it'll take me to the picture. And then with that image selected, what you'll want to do is uh, go over to, um, here, let's try that again. Um, go over to picture, um, right, you can right click on it. Um, one second, let me close this. I'm gonna close my navigation, click over here. Um, and then get to the alt text. Let me check this one here. So under picture, you can go over to um, alt text. So in this case, I've already added a uh, alt text. This one, if I go back to the other one. Um, so this one, it since I brought the image over, it actually uh, tried to put the description of the file right in there. Um, I w you would want to change that. Um, so that's ev this is a good example that even uh, running something like an accessibility check, sometimes it does take a manual check to go through and make sure that things are are uh, properly done. So in this case, it would be a photograph of a cock manual. So if I, uh, whoops. So if I close that and then run the accessibility check again, um, now I've, the accessibility check is complete. Um, there are no issues. All right. So then an, uh, another thing that you can do um, that's helpful is to. Um, you can also, um, there, are, there are some other tools in here um, under the view menu. You can uh, view it in reading mode. Um, that gives you kind of like, a, a, basically it jumps over to a PDF version of your document. Um, you can see um, over here on the side, um, there's a little bookmark type of thing. And if you're using uh, structure properly, though that structure will show up in the bookmarks. Um, also, you can use those to navigate. So if I want to jump right to Spaniel or to Cocker Spaniel, um, it just jump it through the document. Um, it's also used for, again, your building functionality into uh, your documents. Um, uh, next, uh, let me go uh, back. Um, to another thing you can do is again if you've structured your document right um, hopefully it will work with things like the immersive reader um, you can access this in this mode or back in the one before but in that case what you can do is it will um, you can use it to read through uh, your text you can change things there the immersive reader is now built into OneNote, uh, Word, um, Online. Um, I believe it works even in uh, Microsoft Edge. But what you can do is uh, you can play. Animals, a living organism that feeds on organic matter, typically having specialized sense organs and nervous system. You can also um, uh, change your text preferences. You can increase the size. You can decrease it. Um, you can uh, have it, uh, right now I've got nouns turned on. Um, I can turn on adverbs and verbs, um, and I can change the colors so that they show up. Um, you can use line focus. There's things like this that you can do um, and uh, move through content that way and have it read. Able to respond rapidly to stimuli, mammals, this was also a good test to see whether your documents are um, are properly structured. All right, I probably shouldn't have done what I did there. Um, but anyways, um, I think you get the idea. Uh, so next I'd like to uh, also show like in Microsoft PowerPoint, um, you can also um, do the same kind of accessibility check. Um, you go to the review menu check accessibility, 
and uh, don't worry about seeing information on the slide right now. What I want to demonstrate is the accessibility checker. It'll give you some errors, let you know that you may have to check the reading order of some of those slides. But if you click on picture or whatever picture is missing alternative text, again, um, you, you, the, the item should get selected and then you go to the format menu in Microsoft PowerPoint and the alt text is right there um, to fix. So I can click that, I'm close my checker at the moment. Um, I'm just gonna put group, uh, or you top, uh, top view of group holdings, something like that. And then I'll close that, and then I'll uh, I can run that accessibility check again, and then now that it's just the warning about manually you have to go in and check the slide order, but that uh, alt text is missing. Another thing in Microsoft uh, again in Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, it's easier to see on um, on. Uh, the desktop version, but uh, you can go in, you can also see up at the top, there's under layout, you can see your layout slide designs. Um, and if you're not using uh, a slide design, you should, um, or you can create a new master slide that has uh, placeholders in there so that that text does show up in uh, outline mode. So there, there are little things like that that you can um, do to improve the accessibility uh, of your PowerPoint presentations as well. Um, let's see. Let me refresh. So uh, let's see. The other, uh, again, over in... Um, uh, over in uh, OneNote, uh, we talked about that you can take text. Um, you can, um, I, I do not believe you can necessarily do it in uh, Word Online, but if you're wanting to do optical character re recognition in uh, OneNote, on, or OneNote desktop, um, you can pull your, you can um, go to your quick notes, or, or if you've been uh, done some things with Office Lens or something, you can take a picture or something, go uh, pull down your uh, OneNote to the desktop, and then you can run uh, um, optical character recognition on those as well. You can also um, you can also check accessibility of your OneNote documents. Um, you can also um, do the immersive reader with one notes um, we've been finding with uh, the tutoring center um, that uh, if you're wanting to uh, take like a word document or a PDF document you can copy it into a one note uh, and then annotate over the top of it with uh, like some of the drawing tools or highlighters or things like that and then uh, you can actually um, annotate over a document um, and then those doc you can save that uh, you can save that uh, same uh, um, you can save that same all these annotations will save you can save out of uh, one note as a PDF or as a um, as another one note that you could share back with students that kind of thing um, but you would have to give the, right now. You'd have to give that to them through either like an email or post the OneNote inside of Blackboard. Right now, uh, it, um, the faculty cannot share back with the students at this time. Where um, Harper is working on some of the security issues. Hopefully, that will happen soon. Um, but um, with something like this, where you want to save your annotations, you can you go up to the file menu. Um, you can print to file um, on the desktop version. You can save it out as a PDF and share that back with the annotations with your students, that type of thing. 
Um, okay, so let's. I'm going to toggle back to the presentation for a minute. Uh, so, also um, audio. Uh, if you're going to provide audio uh, to your students, uh, one. Um, you'll you'll want to make sure that uh, it's accessible. Uh, way, uh, try to make sure that you're creating high quality video. If you can record video in a quiet space, um, I've heard of people going into their closet and recording video, uh, or I'm sorry, audio, uh, because the clothes dampen the sound. Um, you know, people. I've heard of people doing the, some of their podcasts right out of their closet. Um, also, low background audio, making sure that uh, a fan's not running in the background, making sure you have minimal background noise, um, your dog is not barking uh, while you're recording. Um, speak clearly and slowly. Give people time to process the content. Um, doing an occasional pause. Provide transcripts ahead of time if possible. Um, so again, there's links out to for more information, um, how to create a transcript. Um, maybe I can. I will also show that um, with Microsoft Stream. Maybe if I can, if I have time. Let's see. Um, video accessibility again uh, to ensure the accessibility um, of using videos. Um, you'll want to make sure if you're going to be recording your own video that you consider using a script or a storyboard maybe to think it through. Um, try to make sure there's captions of relevant audio information. Um, it is important to, uh, if you can, uh, provide descriptive uh, text um, of of any uh, information uh, similar to subtitles um, when you're watching something like Netflix or TV you'll often see uh, card or slams um, muffled uh, talking uh, things like that uh, that so if you um, are recording uh, using uh, a technology like Camtasia or things like that you can have it um, capture system audio um, or you can address you know uh, if you're wanting to do that but uh, in some cases it may not necessarily be clear um, as to what you're saying instead of click here and and things like that you want to try to avoid um, some of these things when you're uh, recording video um, so audio descriptions basically for any content that's displayed visually on screen um, can that but are not spoken um, you're gonna want to instead of um, mixed up I, I've mixed up this bowl you know you, I've mixed up this bowl of oatmeal to a thick consistency um, just being um, thinking ahead of time of what what is what you're trying to convey in your content again um, there is uh, link here for more information on how to do captioning. Again, everybody has Office 365, so you have access to Microsoft Stream. Uh, you can upload a video, um, and then actually it'll run an auto um, an auto caption, um, and you can you, you can pull down the transcript um, after it's run its auto captions. Or you can uh, go to your My Content, uh, edit the video, and you can actually repair the captions right next to um, the video as it's playing. It has a really nice feature where you can just kind of loop back a couple seconds um, as you're listening to it and, and repair it. Um, this can also be done in YouTube. If you put your videos up to YouTube, YouTube will also auto caption. Uh, we have found that. Microsoft Stream does a better job. The only problem, again, right now is that you can't share your videos from Microsoft Stream. Um, so you would have to download the video uh, from Microsoft Stream or pull it back down, download the transcripts um, as a, a VTT file, and then you can convert the VTT file 
to uh, the YouTube um, format and put that up to back up to YouTube if you'd like to do that. Um, does sound like a lot of work, but uh, in all honesty, if you're do, using something like Blackboard Collaborate, you can put up your Collaborate videos to stream, pull down the VTT file, and the VT file can be uploaded right back um, to your um, Collaborate recordings. Um, you have to go to Collaborate, um, back to your Collaborate recordings, and you can upload a VTT file directly back up to Blackboard Collaborate. So again, there are some links here for that. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, LMS accessibility. So um, one of the important things um, in uh, Blackboard is to ensure or make, again, similar to what I displayed in the Microsoft Word document, you're wanting wow. to make sure you have some good page structure um, so that when you're using something like a, a course menu or a course, uh, the quick links, it, it's going to help those students that are making use of assistive technology or, or keyboard shortcuts, things like that, that um, it allows them uh, to easily navigate your content, making sure things aren't three um, content folders deep, um, you know, uh, try and make, you know, the best recommendation would be to keep it simple and consistent. Um, also, uh, consider uh, the styles. Think about styling of your text and things like that. So one of the most common uh, accessibility issues in Blackboard, so the, the Blackboard uh, learning management system is very accessible or, or for the most part has, has been fairly accessible but it's only as accessible as the content that you put in it so if um, it, it's not recommended to copy content from Word directly into Blackboard um, I you know I would recommend if you if you are if you do have a lot of content from Word that you would like to put in there you would take that content out put it into like a simple text editor like notepad and then copy it back into Blackboard um, and fix some of the fonts and uh, the formatting because um, it can be troublesome um, when students, some students that are, again are low vision or um, have certain disabilities, will use their own style sheets. Um, and uh, what happens is when you paste that content in from Word, it will pick up some of the styles, the styling and the styles from Word, and it drops it right into say, uh, you know, a, a item window, and. Uh, in some cases, that's considered in inline styling, and it, um, if someone was to turn their own uh, style sheet, uh, it would override that. It would not change. It would not enlarge. It, it may. It would stay whatever the styles that were brought over with it. So just thinking about that, I mean. May, just be considerate about uh, your font selection. You're not using like a cursive font in Blackboard. Um, your color, just minimize, you know, minimize your use of color, making sure you're not using color um, for any, uh, you know, specific meaning uh, that is assumed. Um, if, you know, like red, green, yeah, red, yellow, and green for uh, go, slow, stop. Um, just make sure um, that you're not using color only as in, uh, for meaning. Um, again, making sure your hyperlinks are uh, not just a long URL um, or uh, consider typing out some text, um, select and highlight that text, and then add the hyperlink to it that way. Again, alternative text in Blackboard um, it's there. Uh, you, when you add an image um, to Blackboard, um, you, you know, add a, um, add a description for that image if necessary, or if it had, if it, if it conveys uh, some meaning, um, like a chart or something like that that you want to display. 
uh, in a Blackboard page, making sure that you're adding alternative text to that uh, definitely helps out. Um, keyboard shortcuts, um, again, for people that have mobility issues, uh, they will rely on things like keyboard shortcuts to navigate uh, information. Um, there are other mobility uh, disabilities that make use of eye tracking and uh, mouth sticks for navigation. Um, again, if you build uh, structured content, um, and have good navigation, uh, they should be able to make use of these same kind of keyboard shortcuts. Um, but it would, um, they'd also use it with their assistive technology, can work with those same keyboard shortcuts to navigate content. Um, in this case, the, in the image, uh, the quick links in Blackboard uh, is activated. It shows uh, almost like a table of content and some um, landmarks. Um, that students can navigate or uh, quickly, um, uh, or by using things like sh uh, the keyboard shortcuts: uh, Control Alt M, con uh, Shift Alt L, uh, opens Quick Links, um, and uh, Control Alt M opens the global navigation menu. So things that go a long way to help uh, people uh, that have disabilities navigate. Um, within Blackboard. Um, and then also there is a content editor for math formulas uh, in there as well. Um, again, these art resources will take you to more information about accessibility in Blackboard Learn, um, Blackboard White Papers that have more information about Blackboard, uh, our, our learning management and the accessibility of it. Uh, Another important thing is to evaluate linked. Again, um, try to avoid using uninformative link phrases like click here, read more, more info. It's not very good practice. Um, it's done all the time on the web, um, but it's uh, if you can use meaningful text for hyperlinks, that's it's much more encouraged uh, to make sure you're web pages and um, your content in Blackboard is uh, more useful to students with disabilities. Um, check the hyperlink length. Uh, shouldn't be too long, shouldn't be too short. Um, maybe uh, you may um, make, make uh, uh, take exam, you know, take things, uh, URL, uh, put it into something like Bitly. Um, Google used to have uh, a URL shortener I don't believe it's available anymore, but things like Bitly can shut that link down, um, but then uh, put that shorter link on meaningful text. Um, again, if you want to learn more about uh, links and hypertext, uh, WebAIM um, has a great article, or has an article that explains in more depth about links and hypertext. And then uh, websites, if you're linking out to external websites, um, it's important to uh, make sure those websites are accessible. If um, So basically what web accessibility means is that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. Um, more specifically, people can perceive um, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. Um, one of the standards is, uh, one of the standards is WCAG 2.0, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, that, uh, this, this information comes from the W3C. Um, it, it allows, you, you wanna make sure that your, these websites can, are, also be easily navigated, easily interacted with. Um, if you can also run an accessibility check using a tool like uh, the uh, web accessibility evaluation tool from WebAIM called WAVE, um, I could uh, possibly demonstrate that to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, and then markup, the W3C also has a markup validation tool. You can just drop that URL in there and uh, it'll tell you how many errors or
problems that page has. Um, if you do that, um, you know, and your the website that you're pointing to comes back riddled with accessibility issues, you may consider you may you may want to find another resource or another alternative website for that same content. Um, and uh, you know, there is information on these pages uh, for a more in-depth introduction to web accessibility. Uh, this resource uh, right here. Um, has a, a lot of great videos um, that show uh, people using assistive technology um, and if you can you can go back through some of those videos and it'll show just give you an idea of what some someone with a disability uh, will run into um, so there that's definitely something that you might want to consider looking at um, the uh, um, other thing to consider with web accessibility is, um, you know, you, you, you want to make sure that if you're giving a student an assignment related to uh, a resource or an external web resource, um, that you're making sure that, you know, will they be able to get through that resource uh, in order to complete the assignment. So you have to be somewhat... Uh, consider it to their uh, you know their their condition if they're unable to um, navigate or adding you know giving them extra time to complete that assignment possibly um, and working through uh, whether you do have to switch to another resource or not uh, in that case so um, another thing uh, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar. Um, our library res uh, resources at Harper College are second to none. I mean, there, we we have as good of a, a library as many four-year institutions. Our college uh, provides several subscriptions to e-text journals and video streaming repositories. Uh, these repositories are uh, especially. F uh, filled with uh, very good content, uh, digital text. Um, so, it, you know, if you're having trouble, if you find you have a lot of PDFs that are scanned or are, are dated, um, consider going over to one of these e-texts and download a, um, a few pages. You can do up to a few pages. You can do a whole chapter. You can do a whole book. Um, I wouldn't recommend maybe necessarily downloading a whole book to PDF that again that can be troublesome but uh, giving uh, links you can link directly into a chapter you can direct you can link directly into a page using both like ebook central and ebook the ebooks on at web host I know I believe there's another uh, uh, ebook repository related to community college uh, information and uh, possibly textbooks. Um, also, there's just a, a plethora of journals and uh, JSTOR, Medline, Psych Info, um, Encyclopedias, ERIC, uh, which is a big one for research, um, and then the stream and video uh, repositories. Uh, mo most of the videos have captions in the, uh, these, these are just three of them. I know there, I believe there is more uh, stream and video repositories, but uh, these are the three big ones. Uh, Alexander Street, Intellicom, Films on Demand. Um, most of the videos on, on these have uh, captions. Alexander Street, I know, ha does, uh, um, it may be even Films on Demand, have a very nice, uh, what's called an interactive transcript. So while you're watching the video, you can actually see the text highlighted as the video playing. Uh, again, Universal Design for Learning, may, the visual of watching the video, the auditory for hearing the video, and then visual as the text is going across the text. You can also click on the transcript uh, to quickly navigate through a, a video. So your multiple means, uh, again, of representation, um, 
Stu's, uh, it's you're hitting it on multiple levels, um, hitting that those uh, learning uh, styles on multiple levels. Um, so if you are uh, need some information uh, more on how to do some of these searchings and things, reach out to one of our librarians. Um, there are librarians for each discipline. Um, our library faculty liaisons for those disciplines, um, and those links are to jump out to Harper College Library, and the services are right here on this slide as well. Um, I'm trying to leave some time for questions. Um, any questions that have come up yet, uh, Janet or uh, Stephanie? Oh, we have we have a number of questions. Are you ready for them? Okay. Some great questions uh, in the chat. Sure, I'll do my best. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm going to go back here to PowerPoint. So this was asked by a number of people if they already have their PowerPoints recorded with audio, you know, where you could record each slide. Do you have to re-record that to get the captions? Uh, yes, you probably would. So uh, one thing. It's not the maybe the quickest, easiest solution, uh, but what I would recommend, if you can, to uh, possibly pull the, the audio back out. Um, I believe you can do that on a per slide basis. Um, pull it down as a, a file and then, uh, you know, either run a, a uh, an auto caption on that. I guess... Uh, it depends on how you're doing it. You could record that video with it playing the audio and ha try to have it do an auto caption. It may or may not work depending on the quality of your audio. But uh, usually what I would recommend is, is recording the audio um, separate and put it in on a per slide basis um, if, you, if you can do that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, thanks, Chris. And I would yeah. say, too, um, if a faculty member does have a question about that, to, to fill out our online resource form so that we can help them, help walk them through that. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you do PowerPoint um, capture, so that's where it does the subtitles, does that create transcripts? Uh, no, it does not. It's um, I can demonstrate that briefly right here. So if I click on uh, use subtitles in Office, uh, this is Office 365 again, the PowerPoint online. Um, you have to turn off the simplified ribbon in order to see these options. Um, so if you're not seeing it initially, make sure your simplified ribbon is turned off, and then you can go over. Uh, select use subtitles and then you can choose whether you want it to show at the bottom top below above um, you can also even change and translate from uh, what uh, a language uh, from what like if I can be speaking English and have my subtitle show up as um, Hindi or French or uh, Estonian um, things like that but uh, so then when I uh, I will demonstrate this so now if I go into uh, full screen mode um, and now you should be able to see the subtitles show up hopefully in or underneath it may take a minute for it to get started but what I'm uh, demonstrating here is on this slide uh, this was a storyboard that we used for our video uh, orientation week um, these were just some initial ideas uh, what you're seeing on the slide here is uh, uh, an illustration uh, representing uh, the idea of a green uh, environment right or a green uh, sustainability effort uh, we have some notes on the right hand side um, showing the author, the project, the version. So um, as you can see, it does a pretty good job with the auto or the live captioning, uh, but um, you would have to probably record using um, this, but then it's 
what's considered open captions, not closed captioning. Closed captioning allows you to open turn on and off the captioning, where in this case, if you were to record this, these captions would be burned into the video, if, if that makes sense. Um, it, 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 are the subtitles video uh, visible as I'm talking? Yes, we could see them. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, uh, exit out. Uh, did, did that answer the question or did that help? Uh, yeah, I, I think I, that's, yeah, I think that's good. Um, here's a, here, this should be a quick question. Does adding sure. audio to the PowerPoint dramatically increase the size of the PowerPoint file? It, it, it does. Um, I gotta be honest with you. Um, it, it, the number of slides, uh, the number of images, um, it does increase the size of the file. Um, audio files, it, it's kind of a funny thing. I mean, you, it's a balancing act, right? Uh, if you uh, go out to um, a browser and you pull an image from like uh, um, one of these streaming or one of the um, like free stock photo companies, the, that image, is, some of those images are, are incredibly huge. Um, if you drop them into a PowerPoint and you're scaling you know, they're scaled down to match the PowerPoint, but uh, those file sizes can be extremely large. Um, as for audio, um, again, there are things you can do if you're using something like Audacity or uh, other tools. Uh, you can, you know, uh, convert from a WAV file to an MP3 file, which drastically reduces the size of your audio files. So you may want to consider uh, doing some of that before, you know, on a putting those uh, audios uh, files up on a uh, per slide. But if you got 60 slides, you got 60 audio and images, yeah, your, your file sides are gonna get pretty large. Does that answer the question? Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, uh -huh. You had mentioned you had mentioned uh, a simple text editor, and there was just a question. Basically, what is a text editor, and what would you use it for? So um, there are uh, free ones out there uh, that that you can download. Um, the idea is that. Uh, to minimize the styling of that text when you're putting it into Blackboard or, or something like that. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, what happens, uh, again, uh, text editor, even like Notepad is not the best because Notepad you can't really control much of the um, formatting in Pad. Uh, WordPad uh, used to always come with Microsoft um, operating system it's similar to word but uh it's like a, a lighter word version of word um so the idea is that you don't have too much uh styled content like in a word document just copying it over i would usually copy that content into something like a, a an editor and um text editor. Um, so in this case, um, I have one, it's called uh, Notepad++. Um, if you can see my screen, hopefully. Uh, um, but basically, uh, there's one um, called Notepad++, and that is free for use. Um, it uh, um, does allow you to uh, change from uh, HTML or text uh, from, you know, you can copy p paste content in there um, and then kind of clean up the formatting before maybe bringing it over to Microsoft Word. It, um, I don't know if that answers the question. Let me see. Um, if, I, if you just type in text editors and say like Google, You should be able to find several that are, are, are freely available uh, for use. Um, I, I don't know about Sublime Text, but um, Notepad++ will be one of the first ones you'll find. Um, and it's it, a lot of times, I even when you're copying things from like uh, your clipboard, um, like if you highlight across something on a website or, or from another document, you can uh, hyper, you know, 
uh, highlight across PDF and then copy the text, paste it into Notepad, kind of reformat it, things like that. It's, uh, it's helpful for those kind of things. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Chris. We have a few more questions. Um, so I'll ask this one before because people may have to uh, get out pretty soon. So sure. with all of this information, um, with accessibility, can you give one or two suggestions on where faculty can start for improving the accessibility in their course and their content? Um, what would be well, your again, top I, two suggestions? <laughs> um, probably <laughs> making sure their syllabus is accessible, run an accessibility check on your syllabus would be maybe one of the first things I would recommend. Um, if you're not using our Harper College syllabus, it, it may have some issues with accessibility. Um, if you are using our Harper College syllabus, um, uh, it, it, um, it has been built in, uh, some of the accessibility is built in there already. Um, but maybe just going, other things would I would recommend is maybe just checking some of the, um, any kinds of PowerPoints or uh, PDF document that you um, have set as required uh, content for your class, like uh, possibly running an accessibility check on them. Uh, there has been an accessibility checker in both Word and uh, Microsoft PowerPoint uh, since uh, 2010, I believe. Um, and uh, so usually uh, in 2010 and 2013, you have to usually go to the file menu um, and it's what's called the backstage and, and then check for issues, check accessibility, and you can, um, it'll run the same kind of accessibility check that I showed in uh, the online app, and then you can repair your alt text and, um, you know, any other kinds of accessibility issues you may have. So that's, that I would recommend, you know, if at all possible, maybe checking some of those. If you need help, by all means, contact us in the academy. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to help uh, with that. Um, you know, the uh, a lot of times that's the same kind of issues that access and disability services will have to address if you have an accommodation uh, in your class. And unfortunately, in most cases, like with uh, textbooks, um, sometimes access and disability services will have to take apart a whole book and scan them and then make them accessible. So uh, just choosing the right publisher and the right con, you know, is important. Um, you know, if you're finding that several of your classes in your curriculum are not accessible, it might be time to consider a different publisher that's providing accessible, uh, you know, content. Because uh, again, I'll, I'll tell you, most almost all vendors, all publishers will tell you they're accessible. All of our content's 508 accessible. But when you start testing some of it, you you find out pretty quickly that that's not necessarily the case. Um, so, uh, just a thought. That I mean. Thanks, Chris. You know what? We're just about up with time. There was another sure. question with discuss discussion boards, but why don't you wrap up? The presentation for people who have to leave, and then um, we, we could, could stick around that. at the sure. end. Yeah, we could address the discussion board question, and if anybody else has any further questions, we'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards to answer them. So go ahead and, and wrap we'll, up here, Chris. We'll do. We'll do. Uh, Stephanie, did you want to take these last couple slides? Yeah, you know, we've had some inquiries about events that are canceled where people are not able to get CEUs that they were counting on. So we just want to remind everyone that you can get CEUs for these. We're converting some other events that were meant to be on campus to virtual events. We will have CEUs. We have some new things in development right now, some online book discussions, some more potential you know, things potentially related to supporting online instruction. So just stay tuned. Um, some things will be coming out, but definitely make sure you fill out your form here to get your CEUs. And um, stay tuned to the Academy News and email announcements to come out because we will be having more opportunities uh, posting soon. So thanks so much for being here. If you still have a question, 
if you want to go to the next slide, Chris, we wanted to remind everybody that um, you can fill out that form. See the green box at the bottom right hand corner, the online instruction support form. That way we can match your request with someone from our team that can best help you. And then also, as these webinars have rolled out, we've been adding additional videos and white papers and other resources. So see where that red uh, box is circled, the uh, resources and supports. There's a lot of things there already existing that'll probably answer a lot of your questions. But anyway, if you don't see what you need, please reach out to us. And if you have ideas for things you think would support faculty, please let us know. Thanks everybody for being here. Like Janet and Chris said, we will stick around if you want to ask a few more questions, but otherwise we'd like to wrap up for people so that they can get going to their uh, next part of their day. So again, if you have more questions, you can still keep typing them in the chat area. Um, if you want to go back and review something from this webinar today, by the end of the day tomorrow, it will be up um, along with the other webinars. So thanks everybody for being here. We really appreciate it. And for those of you who had a couple more questions and want to stick around, um, we're welcome you to do that.